You are listening to the Exploder Wrestling Podcast, a ZTO TV podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt your normally scheduled program to bring you a special episode of Exploder. Now, I don't do this often, but every once in a while, I'll bring on special guests. And today, I have not one, but two special guests. I want to start with the voice of war wrestling, a legitimate announcer. Please welcome Michael McCormick. That's the nicest thing anyone's ever said in an intro about me. (laughs) I do the best I can. And... Probably be the last thing someone says nice about me on the show, too. Well, I'm on this show, probably. And on the other end, maybe on the other end, I'm not sure how he's going to go, but a man from more wrestling, future great wrestling, please welcome the manager of champions, or, or if you don't believe me, just ask him, Ripper Blackheart. You don't have to ask me. There is photographic proof. And if it's on the internet, it's true. That is very true. That is very true. Tonight, gentlemen, we are here to talk about something very important, very close to all of us. We're here to talk about some of the greatest moments in war wrestling. Now, I'm going to start with you, Ripper. You've been there quite a bit longer. You're, uh, old. you're old, yes. And I just want to say, what off the top of your head, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about war wrestling? First thing that comes to mind is 17 years of great professional wrestling. That's what that's the first thing. You say war wrestling, to me, we're that is one of the top independent promotions in the state of Ohio. And mm-hmm. it's not being I'm not bragging. I'm not trying to be a ass about it. It's truth. If you don't believe me, come to a show, see the crowd, see the reaction, see the product, and see why there's a list. 20 miles long at the shortest at to, of guys who want to get on this show. So that's what it means to me. First thing it means to me is one of the best promotions there is in independent wrestling. Absolutely. It's hard to disagree. As somebody who grew up in the grew up around the Lima area, I came into war, oh my goodness, probably about 10 years or so. I, I came in and started, well, I came in just as a fan. I did a little bit of security work, and you're not kidding. This is a promotion that draws seven, eight, nine hundred 900 people without a big name on the, you know, not a, an indie guy or a big TV guy. And so I, I will 100% give it on. Going to the same question, Michael McCormick, another guy you've seen it all, you've talked about most of it. What do you think of, in addition to what Dripper saying, what do you think of when you think of war wrestling? Well, it's kind of funny because I kind of have to piggyback that and go back to what he's talking about, about the lines. I remember, I wish I could remember what the year was. I want to say 2009 or 2010, where there's this huge snowstorm outside the UAW Hall. Uh-huh. And it snowed, I, I, it was something crazy, like six inches or something in a couple of days. And the show was at seven. And what I remember is, is getting there early and Ripper and Big Tom had been there at, I think at like 10 and said, there's people out here. I said, okay, that's fine. Got there around noon, 1230 something. And there's a line right by just kind of out the door and way out there. And I remember just thinking these people know the shows at seven o'clock because (laughs) this is before, you know, this is mostly first come first serve. And if that doesn't draw a testament to kind of how great things have been, like you guys said, there's not a, a claim on the show, I believe right. that night, but no. guys that have come through, I mean, you can go to YouTube, look, and I was just looking at it and thinking every week when I turn on TV, any major promotion, those guys have come through there, and you can find matches every week on TV where one or two guys have come in for, you know, anywhere from one to 10 or 12 shows, whatever it is. And it's just, it's such a cool thing. And I just wish more people were able to see it right now. I, re- I remember that. I remember the show you're talking about. That show was there was a bad storm. It was in Lima, and it actually went up through Michigan because the Michigan invasion was to come in. And none of the Michigan guys could make it. So I, I think I, I think it was when we had the ice storm, wasn't it? And like power, like where I lived, the power was still yeah. out in, in my yeah. area. When I went they, there that day, it was out yeah. when I came home. Yeah, it was bad. I remember that because it was like, yeah, it was none of the Michigan guys made it. And I think that show, I'm pretty sure that show was still like seven, 800 people. People got shoveled out just in time to come to the show. Yeah. Like and that's, 
what McCormick was talking about, that that was nothing new, the line of people. Right. right. That's why that's well, why they, they switched to the reserve front row, second row, third row. Yeah. So people wasn't going there. I mean that well, was, I remember that. that was I remember average. those when they were they were lining up. Yeah, I remember they were starting to talk about the show. Yeah, they were lining up at like one, two o'clock. Yeah. You know, I mean that was the one or two o'clock and they were lining up for a show that like you said, they weren't even gonna open the doors till seven. Well, they even, knew that. But it even, didn't even matter what the weather was. No, been, not at all. There was arc rain happening, like you said. Yeah. Right. Winter storm come through, whatever. They were there every single time, lined up, you know, out there, you know, throwing footballs with and all that stuff, yeah. just killing time. But they were always was always a line for a war show. Now, you, you talk about, you both mentioned this, and you're both absolutely 100% right. You're talking about the, the, the pipeline of people that have, not only people that want to go into war wrestling, but people that are current, that have been through the doors and, and been around over the years. I mean, there are, there are numerous names of people that have came and went. People now that are on a national scale, they started out, and one of their first promotions was war wrestling. I mean, uh, who could, you know, uh, of course, the remember is John Moxley, you know, starting out in, in this area. And there, there are so many talents that either they were just about to become a big thing or they were here really early in their careers and then became something big. What either, this goes to either one of you, but what at the top, like, what are the person that you would think of when you think of that people might be surprised to think that they got their start in war wrestling? The Highlanders. Yep. The Highlanders was like we were one of the few Ohio United States promotions that they were wrestling in regularly, and uh, we were we were getting ready to push them huge, and they got the deal, the OVW deal, and went down there. Uh, another one would be Jillian Hall, if you guys if they remember her, she she wrestled under her indie name there. Um, was it Michaela Mercedes McCormick? Yeah. And yeah, she was the first the first year of war wrestling. She was there on a regular basis as Michaela Mercedes. Uh, like I said, you've had her, you've had the Highlanders. John Moxley, he showed up a couple times. Uh, Seth Rollins, so he yep. was doing a tour through there and just had me coming through the area. And Danny Daniels was a, got in Tom's ear and said, uh, "Hey." You need to find something for this this kid to do when he's coming through. So yeah, Which, he's by been, the way, hey, shameless plug. If you want to hear that story, you can look up Tales from the Indies on iTunes, and you can hear Danny Daniels tell that whole story. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to do part I, of that. By the way, when he started telling that story, <laughs> I had heard bits and pieces of the uh, the Rollins thing from Iowa all the way out to Buffalo, but I had never heard the whole story before. Yeah. Yes, I do want to do a quick. I, I do want to do a quick plug for that. These guys have a amazing podcast called Tales from the Indies, where it's these two talking to the who's who of professional wrestling on the independent scene. Really great podcast. Check that out. Like I said, it's wherever you find podcasts, and they talk to some pretty awesome names, and they have some great stories. So I want to just check that out when you get the chance. My first match was August thirty first in. Uh... 97. I remember there was a show in November of 97 and the Bushwhackers were on it. <laughs> I remember I called my girlfriend at the time and I'm like, I made it. The Bushwhackers were on the card. You know, in my mind, I didn't care. I just, it was the Bushwhackers and I thought it was a big deal. These guys I watched on TV and did it go to my head at the beginning? No, I was, I was very opinionated and arrogant that I knew how wrestling worked more than others, but it didn't go to my head because I, I knew that all right. I wasn't very athletic or I couldn't cut the best promo. So I still took it with a grain of salt on what I could contribute with wrestling. I just knew I could contribute with my knowledge, how I can make people react. Yeah. I always thought, Hey, I might not have the best drop kick, but I could be the most charismatic and get a fan's reaction on an indie show. That was my contribution to it at the time. That's how I felt. Another one of the names that always pops up to me when I look back at it is Ethan Page because Ethan Page is yes. all over Impact Round, all over everything. Mm -hmm. He was in the International House of Pain. Those guys yeah. uh, did an amazing job. And you've got, when you look at Impact specifically, you can see a lot of those guys oh, and girls God. from that show. I mean, I mean yeah. we had you know, Nevaeh and Jessica Havoc fight each other a handful of times, and yep. now they're mm -hmm. part of a main angle there. And that's kind of 
cool to just see you go. I remember, but I, I know uh, Dusty Dillinger's told a story numerous times about the only time that Test, Andrew Martin, ever worked. Yes. In show, WWE, was I in Lima, Ohio. Him. I remember him. Yes, I do remember that. That was one because he had never because he got signed and he went straight to the B. He had never worked the independence. So when he came in, he came in for war. That was like the only time he'd actually done an indie show. Yeah. And he uh, he sat in, he sat just on the other side of that entrance curtain through that entire show, and watched every match. Wow. So it was time for him to get ready. And then this, mm. this is going to tell you how long ago it was. Then he got on MySpace <laughs> yeah. the, next day, <laughs> the next day and just wrote a great review about, you know, the, the promotion. And I think we were, we weren't war at that time. I think we were, we were doing the, this is the back end of the GWA. Yeah. The yeah. GWA. It was global. Yeah. Yeah. With, yeah. When, when Tom got sick and, uh, uh, Dusty took over. Uh, but yeah. And he wrote a, Nice story, story, little little review wow. about his experience there and all that. So we that that kind of popped us a little bit. Reading that made us feel a little bit proud about <laughs> what we were doing. So yeah, yeah. And too, one of, one of my favorites is still Jerry Lawler because oh yeah, a little Tom will forever be a dick because <laughs> he had me curse at Jerry Lawler uh, indirectly <laughs> because I told. Jerry Lawler to get the F out of my way because I <laughs> couldn't see the monitor, but I was actually talking to little Tom. So I guess, you know, I, Jerry Lawler just kind of turned and walked down the stairs. I'm like, I, I wasn't really <laughs> Jerry Lawler. Okay. AJ Styles thinks you're a dick too. Cause you think, Oh, you know, he's just an indie fed. <laughs> yeah. He's, he was amazing. He was, uh, he's still one of my favorite interviews we've ever done. Yeah. I, I threw, I threw, McCormick under the bus like I usually do during that interview yeah. and yeah, uh, twice. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you'll be don't. happy to know. You'll be happy to know I did the same thing to Everett Lee, uh, not two three weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> classic. Yeah. The we classic. were interviewing AJ Styles and uh, he was also selling merch at HWA, the nineteenth incarnation of it, when we were working at the uh, the Ponderosa in Middletown. <laughs> And uh, he's like, hey, man, is it cool with that if I sell some merch while this is going on? Like, AJ Styles, like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, AJ, Styles. you could you could go take a shit, AJ, while you're doing this. <laughs> James, the fact that you're doing all this. Events, yeah, came up. Oh, yeah, that's. And uh, took the microphone whenever AJ would go to make some money. <laughs> I, I love that, though. And that's what's so great is we've talked about this for years um, between doing football and uh, seeing pro wrestling, there's a lot of parallels between how guys are. And it's always amusing to me when we used to do backstage of seeing a guy standing there talking to you, whatever, behind the curtain. And then the second that he goes through, kind of watching how they, you know, the crowd. That's always my favorite interaction. I figure shrinks could just have a field day with that. Oh, sure. Also, we're, we're talking about. We've, we've talked about like war wrestling, what people think of it. We talked about the stars, the people that have sort of come through. My question is, as somebody, and you've both seen this, as the past, I mean, really over a decade and a half now, the company, you've seen this, the generation of the top guys who have came and gone, guys like Matt Mason, uh, guys who have uh, Brian Beach, numerous talents, some still working, but some have actually retired. Jamie Madrox comes to mind, Mike Dodge. All these guys, what is it like? What do you see as far as war wrestling goes? When you see that generation, the, the top guys, and when you see them sort of go their own way, what is it like when you see that next generation? Is there a comparison, or is it just something where you're just basically saying, okay, now it's a new show, now it's fresh? Go ahead, McCormick. I'll let you go first on this one. Well, also Sherman Tank in that group, I'm a huge fan of. Yeah. And one of my favorite matches, you talk about Matt Mason, is actually – uh, the high def supernovas against bad company in uh, oh, the, match, yeah. the ladder match that we got to do ladder for match titles it was a uh, cold war in 2010. And yeah, and that one always sticks with me because that's kind of a, you look at Robbie star trained by Jeff cannon is an old school sort of uh, feel to it. And obviously Sherman tank and how he's brought up and you get 
the I kind of put Mason in a different category in that the as the Novas, they're kind of in that that newer. Um, I don't know how you want to look at any tag team thing of they can go quick, you know, they can slow you down, but it's such a different match and a clash of styles, but it made such an amazing match because they told this great story over the course mm-hmm. of months and, and Matt's wife was involved and, and everybody and all of that, but they told us great story in the ring before they even got to the ladder. And I think that yes. maybe the one thing that changes for me is so many guys want to rush through their spots now. And tanks talked about this. He told a story on our podcast for about an hour one time that uh, he he said guys don't know how to work necessarily. They want to get from spot to spot now. And I think for me, that's the biggest difference in these older guys. And of hey man, slow down. And once you can see the light, once mm. that you go, all right, they're a completely well-rounded performer now. Hmm. With one thing I'll, I'll add this and then I'll, I'll see what Ripper has to say. One thing I remember about that match, that, that exact ladder match beforehand there, there guys are talking or whatever. And all I remember is Matt Mason wanted to do, he wanted to do a superplex on, I believe Chris Hall off the ladder to a table on the outside. He wanted to completely, he wanted to be on the ladder and go back and I remember, like, we're all looking at each other, like, uh, and I'm just sort of listening. And I hear, I think Tank told him, and Tank was like, he's like, he basically told him, like, if you try that, if you miss that rope, you're going to break your neck. Yeah. Like, that was, he, he did, because I was just like, because oh, all we could see is him going and his leg clipping that top rope and him going through the table head first. Yeah, I, I see a lot uh, where they, they want to be a star right now. Right now, they get, they want to have that instant gratification right now of being a star. And yeah. when you pull them off the side and you explain to especially when it's nice when you've got the older guys there mm-hmm. who will pull them off to the side and not feed their ego because they don't give a shit about them feeling good. It's, it's about, you know, learning the craft and doing it right. And what I like to see is when you have those individuals like that who are just worried about the spots, the spots and not understanding why, you know, promoter ain't putting them in the major storylines and whatnot. And then they, they, they start to learn when they learn. And then when they get it, mm-hmm. you see the little thing snap go like that. And then they come back and say, find whoever it was has been telling them this whole time. I'm sorry. You were right. You know, that's what I, I like watching the talent develop. And I have since one, like Joey Vengeance, Joey V and Mike Dodge. I saw them two come right in from the beginning, watch them develop over the years into what they became. Same way with any, like a down at, I'm down at FGW. That to me, that's like a learning promotion. It's like a, like a teaching hospital. You, you've got some guys that's been there and done some stuff, and then you've got all these new guys coming in who are learning while doing. And and like I said, that that's what – it's there, but most of them eventually get it. Eventually it, it clicks that, hey, uh, instead of – I can get the same reaction mm-hmm. doing this much as I do doing this much. I'm getting paid the same thing, so why wouldn't I do right. this much and tell a good story rather than just put out there a human car wreck? Right. Well, that is a perfect segue. I hope he's ready. That is a perfect segue to announce a special guest. I was told he was going to come in. I think he's ready, but he's a former war wrestling champion. He is... I'm just going to say it, a legend in independent wrestling in the Ohio, Michigan, Indiana area. Uh, if he's ready, Mr. Dusty Dillinger, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm ready. How are you? I'm doing great. Good. You can hear me? You can see me? I'm doing good? <laughs> yes, we can. Absolutely. Good. I'm so, traveling right now, so yeah. <laughs> oh, Okay. <laughs> so, Dusty, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're talking okay. about... We're talking about war wrestling. 
uh, just the, another guy who's been in it for years and, and has been all around from retirements to coming back to retiring again. Um, <laughs> I just want to ask you a, a question. What do you think at the end of the day, at the end of the day, how would you, how do you think people are going to see your career in particular in world wrestling? I think it depends on um, who you're talking to. Um, a lot of a lot of the fans now, uh, especially the younger ones, are uh, much more aware of everything. Um, they are uh, much more savvy as far as it goes, and um, I think that they are the ones who it's just going to maybe just be a blip on their their um, to do list. But you get them older people. Uh, I have been around it long enough, or I have had um, people uh, bring their kids to me and say, uh, "This was my favorite wrestler growing up," and they're introducing their kids to me who are like 10, 11 years old. So it makes it very, uh, really, really interesting as far as that goes. But to that person, I think the the career will mean something more than what. The, the people out there now will. Um, I, I just think it's just because of the uh, abundance and availability of all different types of wrestling, whatever. I, I think they're more fans of wrestling than they are fans of one person in particular, I suppose. But uh, they're, all, all of the promotions are set up for the promotion to be the star, not the, the people. But the, the people just have to be a part of the promotion, the performers. But it's still really cool um, at the end of the day, but um, it, it's just different now than what it used to be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, that's what I mean. You're a guy who have been involved in war wrestling, I mean, independent wrestling in general, but war wrestling gentleman. in particular. <laughs> You're an older gentleman. But, I mean, it's, you know, it's with experience and, and somebody there. Like I said, when, you know, we're, we're talking about, we were talking earlier with the Global Wrestling Alliance with that, uh, that interpromotional feud you guys did. I remember that started because oh. you turned on Danny Daniels. Yeah, that thing was, that was hot. I don't think it was uh, yeah. so much Daniels. It was, uh, I think it was Brian Beach, I think, or Steve Stone. I think I lynched both of them. Both of them, uh -huh. yes, I remember that. Oh, okay. Yeah, and oh. that was uh, a major turning point. <laughs> and yes. uh, that interpromotional feud, everybody was at their best. And everyone uh, at that time in that locker room, you didn't have many egos because everybody had done the same things. Everybody had worked for WWF. Something. Everybody had worked for WCW. Yep. So you know, it, 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 so it wasn't the next road. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that was a thing where. That was a kind of angle that was something that at least, I mean, at least Lima had not seen. I mean, it was something that was completely different. And it, it, right. Dusty Dillinger turning and, and creating that group and being the heel and all that was just great. And it was a, that was a feud that went quite a while to, to finally like finish up, but it was a heck of a feud when it happened. Oh, well, well, over, well over a year. Yeah, I yeah, it was that was a long feud. I remember. I mean, like 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 you said, there was so much. The fans were so into it, and there were you know there were clear lines drawn, and there was a you know there were comp literally competing factions, and that's what made it so great but, and so. Believable. No, it's not so much that the fans were really into it. It's just that the guys who were executing executed it flawlessly. They were yes. people who were at the top of their game because realistically. Save for a sparse uh, smattering, almost everyone had been in the business uh, 15, 10, 15 yeah. years at that time. So uh, yeah. we had some very experienced, very seasoned, very good people. I mean, you're talking, you know, the Highlanders, Dean, Dean Jablonski, mm -hmm. um, uh, what's her face, uh, the chick, um, who went on to be the, the half at here. here. The, the shit sing. Jillian. I already mentioned her. Jillian. Yep. We were able to, to 
capture something that, that really hadn't been done in a while in independent wrestling. Uh, honestly, I feel like since ECW, and that's develop a, uh, a, a cult following of people who, you know, were fortunate enough to be there to see it. So when they're telling their kids, are oh, you think that's wrestling? You should have saw uh, uh -huh. this because it's true. Uh, we had it like that. Oh, that's great footage there. That's the first oh, yeah. ever and only that I'm aware of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, scaffolding cage match in the, in the state ever done. Yeah, that was I mean, the yeah, thing I remember was... most from that match is Jock. When you threw Jock that... off the thing, he bounced. He uh, hit the ring and he weight. bounced. <laughs> that much weight, man. That's a lot of momentum. That's yeah, lot. exactly. <laughs> what I remember most. What I remember most is that scaffold was not completely built till the morning yeah, right, of. Right before. Yeah. <laughs> the morning of. Yeah. Started it the night before and, oh. and finished it up that day. Yeah. Oh, jeez. It's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> here he goes. He's, going, he's about to fall off right yeah, here. Yeah, right here. He, yeah. He bounces. I remember oh. that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, isn't that something? That's crazy. Oof. And, you know, wow. the thing is, is uh, people want to, you know, throw around the F word there. But no. you know, I'll readily admit that it's it's fixed. Readily admit it's fixed. However, yeah, you, you, can't, you can't fake that. You, it's just. No. It, it is what it is. It happens, you know. So it's. Uh, <laughs> I, know, I think though a lot of the fans now, they have a greater appreciation for what what we do out there. Um, I think to the fans today, the, the storylines are okay for them, but I think they like to see the, uh, the work put in. They want to see they, – they enjoy the athletic uh, portion of it more so than what they, uh, our generation did. They, they were more interested in the stories. You didn't have to be athletic or all that jazz. But they, the fans today are very much, very, very much into the athleticism, into the art of it, if you will. And, you know, um, I, had, I used to have a very, let's say, poor opinion of uh, the, what some of these athletes today, um, the way they're doing it, um, as far as, you know, telling stories or not telling stories. These people are lucky enough to be able, these fans, to have access to all of that. And be a fan of wrestling, period, versus being a fan of Paul Hogan, per se. Which, which I think that that's uh, also that's also a very good segue with uh, where with the next topic. Talking about professional wrestling, I mean, you know, if you go back into the history, there was a time where a headlock was a finish. I mean, Strangle Lewis was famous for a yeah. headlock. That was, and then. Yeah. The wrestling evolves over time. Things like uh, jumping off the top rope was illegal for the longest time. And then it became okay. And then it became pretty standard. Now, yeah. if you don't do a corkscrew 630, what are you doing? My thing is, going into future great wrestling is where I want to, the next topic. We're talking about the next generation. You talk about that being a, almost like a training center for the younger guys. Does future, future great wrestling, is that seen, and this goes to, Ripper and, and anyone who, who knows about them, anyone who works with them, is that a kind of thing where they're basically trying to combine the two, teaching that old school work ethic, but also realizing there's going to be more of an athletic component? What you know is that the goal of Future Great Wrestling? Yeah, well, overall, the the goal of Future Great Wrestling is to make sure shush, shush, shush you. that there's shush, a future shush. in wrestling. Uh -oh. Hold on, I want to say something. Uh oh, go ahead. I would say something before you go crazy. Um, he mentioned something about how uh, the progression, uh, how the, this used to be a fish and that used to be a fish. Also, go back in the 1960s and look at a fight scene from a movie. And then look at a fight scene now. You can't get away mm -hmm. with that shit now. That right. was going on back in the 60s. Everything has, has, it has to progress. If it doesn't progress, it gets stagnant. And stagnant is rotten and rotten is no good. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's to make sure that there is a future of wrestling, professional wrestling. Cody Hawk wants it to, to carry on. He's the main trainer there. Uh, 
And a lot of the guys there, the younger guys, they do the boom, 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 boom stuff, but they also, also teaching them how to tell a story. You can use that stuff and still mm -hmm. tell a story. So, yeah, more or less, like I said, I, I look at Future Great Wrestling very much as like a teaching hospital is only for wrestling. You got guys like Cody Hawk there, Sean Casey, who have been doing this for a really long time, Jackson Breeze, who's worked behind the scenes of several promotions throughout the years. Uh, I've been doing this for 17 years now. And like I said, oh I've, and I've been doing it with <laughs> Dusty over there and Big Tom and and, I, and Cody Hawk and stuff like that. So, you know, I've paid attention. I know a thing or two. <laughs> not, not, not much more than that, but... So, yeah, and like I said, they got other guys down there that's worked that area for a long time that, that's been doing it for 10 years or more to help help these guys out. And I think uh, that place, more than any place else that I work, there's a lot of, uh, like, the older guys sit and watch all the matches. Like, uh, when Drew Skills was there, Drew Skills come in for a program. He's sitting there, he's watching the matches. If you see something, he'll... After the match, he goes, finds him, say, okay, hey, I saw this in your match. Uh, why'd you do this? That didn't make sense to me. Or here's something you could you could do to do better while you're doing. That was okay, but if you do this or tweak that, which, you know, he don't have to do that. He could just sit there and shoot the shit with everybody and wait till it's his well, time to go out. See, I disagree. I think he does have to do that. Well, That's because if he doesn't, the art of what we do will disappear and be gone. Yeah, I, I don't. Um, I think I don't disagree with what you're saying. I'm just oh, saying, in general, the way things are nowadays, you don't get that a lot. That's true, but and that's where the mistake is. That's how the business has gotten to the point it has. Uh, I believe because veterans, people who've been around, people who paid money, people who paid dues, people who bled, and people who traveled, you know, living out of their car eating bologna sandwiches. Um, those guys uh, did not ensure that the art, the, 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 the way the business is, was going to be moving forward, be progressed, and still be here at the level of, that it was then. But uh, I, I think... I mean, look, look at, let's look at all the, the people out there, even through the 80s, whatever. A lot of those guys were manufactured people. They were guys who paid their dues and all that jazz. So they can't go out there now. We have a big, huge ton of these guys out there trying to work these indies. They have no idea um, what it was really like. So they have nothing to pass along. So these young kids, now they see that, and they think that's the way it is. And that's not the way it is. That's not the way it was. And if we're not careful, people like Drew, people like Apollo – People like uh, um, Dean Jablonski, uh, people like uh, uh, Big Tom, and even Corey Ripper there to a point, um, myself. If we do not make sure we interject ourselves and our belief system and stuff into these kids, it'll be lost. And we'll have some form of what we used to love out there that we don't even recognize probably. Yeah, we better, don't make us become the old guys on our front porch going, get off our lawn. <laughs> or saying, where'd my fucking lawn go? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you call I this wrestling back in my day. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, 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 think it, I think that is true. And I think you're both right on this. It is something where there is a history of, of professional wrestling and it has gone through all those years. And unfortunately, you know, it, it came it, it's sort of a side effect of the expansion of it to where it used to be, it was hard to get into the business. And then as more schools opened up and things started happening, it became easier to have, it became easier to open a school. It became easier to, you know, take people's money and, 
not and pretend to teach them and not teach them what they need to know. And it became more of some guys used it as a way to make money instead of actually protecting and a way of actually yeah. teaching the next generation when they, you know, what they should have. They used it as a work rather than, yes. you know, they, they chose to work people rather than educate them. Right. And that, and that's the kind of thing where that culture. You can part do of both. The right. <laughs> part, of the, <laughs> part of the reason, and the part of the reason that's gone away is like you said, there's enough guys that maybe, maybe even they went to the big times but they didn't respect it enough to actually care and actually teach that next generation so that they would know how to act. I know a guy who keeps telling me he only ever went because of the catering. <laughs> so now I'm very good catering, on the show anymore. You are never bigger than the business. The business has made you. So the business will kill you. Um, so you, you've always got to pay homage to it and be respectful of it because if you're not, you're doing it a great disservice, and as things go on in the annals of history, you will be nothing, but wrestling mm -hmm. will still be wrestling. Absolutely. At this time, speaking of speaking of issues, uh, our producer Frank, uh, our producer Frank has a video he'd like to share with Ripper in particular. Uh, I'm going to cue that up with a special message for Ripper Blackheart. Well, 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 if it isn't my old friend, Ripper Blackheart. We ain't friends. You know, Ripper, I've got to give it to you. You have been absolutely successful throughout your time in the professional wrestling industry. Oh, you well, have managed nice. champions all across the Midwestern territory. You have even managed a former FTW champion in Bad Attitude Brian Beach. But you know, during my exile, yours truly, David Artemis Spector, has had time to think, to contemplate, to reflect, if you will, upon my storied career, and more specifically, on the reason why I have yet to experience the feeling of the FGW Championship in my grasp. And I've come to the conclusion that the reason why is because of you. Because each and every time I was this close to representing the FGW Champion, whether it be Eric Fulton or the Prophet of Pain Amos, you have constantly been a thorn in my side, throwing obstacle after obstacle, roadblock after roadblock in my path, keeping me from what's rightfully mine. And you and I both know the reason why. It's because you are scared. You are absolutely terrified of your inescapable fate. Simply being that if there is indeed an heir apparent to your managerial throne, whether you'd like to admit it or not, it's me. And you know, Ripper, regardless if you'd like to willfully pass the baton or should I say, the evil managerial cane? Or, if I have to pry it from your cold, dead hands by force, one way or another, I will take my rightful spot at the absolute uh, uh, top uh. of the professional wrestling industry. Because you know and everybody knows that you can trust in David Bottom Spectre. Trust in the darkness. <laughs> River Blackheart, your response. Oh. oh man, he talks a lot. I could have got the same point across in half that amount of time. That's why I'm a better manager than him, for one. As a manager, nobody's there to see you. They're there to see the talent that you represent. And as far as manager champions, 
I'm managing champions right now. You go to New Ohio Wrestling and see who's the manager of the New Ohio Wrestling Champion. Guess who that is? That's me. Yeah. You're playing professional wrestling. What? Did you ever manage Dusty to a championship? Manage who? Dusty. Yeah, I did. In a yes. restaurant and somewhere. <laughs> So, yeah, I did. Even I even story. put a belt on Dusty. So, how about that? As far as his place in professional wrestling goes, it is always going to be behind me, Dave, because I've said it once. I've said it a million times. I am never leaving professional wrestling, ever. Well, I'm the lucky one. What's your nickname for Dave, by the way? I nicknamed it Auth Photo Hut Dave because he used to take killer pictures of me. That's right. Photo Hut Dave. He he was a ringside photographer before he got into uh went and got trained and became a man. I thought he was driving Uber in that video. I gotta be honest with you. Uh, probably was. Uh, probably DoorDash or one of those things. <laughs> I know he, he hasn't been able to make someone up or drop off their food. Yeah. <laughs> probably what Dusty's Something. doing now. Door dashing. <laughs> <laughs> well, with those restraining orders and all, it makes it difficult. I think <laughs> you should create an app where you can book a car ride to go to people's house and fight them. <laughs> That'd be all right. That'd be all right. I'd do that. That'd be genius. Oh. oh, that would last. Heck no. You know, I, uh, I, you know, I lost about 40 pounds uh, for my uh, high school reunion. They ended up canceling it. I wanted to be the oh. same way I was in high school where I went. They ended up canceling it. And I called them. I was like, you reschedule. You're going to get me however I look. I don't care. But it's amazing, though, how good the body feels taking all that extra weight off. And it, it's stupid because in my mind, I'm like, hell, I can still do this. Even though I know probably I, I could once or twice. But to have anything sustained at it, which honestly, if, if you're going to go at it, you have to go at it. Full tilt. You can't just be a hobby because you're cheating not only yourself of being able to be great at your craft, but the people that are paying, the fans, are, are being cheated out of seeing and experiencing something that makes them want to return time after time after time and want them to to buy that t-shirt, uh, make them want to buy that, that 8 by 10 or whatever it might be. Um, you're just doing everybody a great disservice there. My opinion. On which Absolutely. has many. <laughs> and nothing wrong what? with that. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, gentlemen. Thank you all for joining us for this special episode of Exploder. I don't have guests on much. When I do, I make sure there's people I like and respect. And I well, how the hell involved. did we get on? Well, <laughs> McCormick's well, iffy, but everyone else. You said gentlemen earlier on, and I was super confused. <laughs> hey, let me say something. Since you have Michael Hearn on there, let me tell you something. Uh, for those promotions that do do DVDs and uh, whether it be uh, web pay-per-views, all that kind of stuff, uh, people like Michael Hearn, Michael Hearn has put in a lot of time, a lot of work, and he's watched a lot of his stuff back, and he's went out and he's tried to learn more about helping to get storylines over, helping to get guys over, um, understanding why he is doing or saying what he's doing, how his inflection matters, all these types of things. And uh, there's a lot of promotions that have guys like him, and those guys also need a shout-out in independent wrestling because they are the ones who can sometimes make or break a, a match especially if you have guys who are inexperienced or whatever in the ring, those guys right there are, are uh, wildly important and needed. And I like his own Hearn especially because I've worked with him and he's always trying to get better and he wants to be great at his craft. And there is absolutely room for everyone to get better at their craft, even the commentators because they are an integral part of what we do out there. And without them, 
then, you know, uh, a move is just a move, but they can sell something. They can make something bigger than what it might actually be. And uh, I just want to say uh, thank you, Michael Hearns, for the work that you've done, and especially uh, for the stuff you've done on my matches and uh, the stuff we've done together. I, I'm really proud of it. And you. I just want to say thank you for all that you've taught me. And uh, I joke a lot about, you know, watching how you go about different things. It really does give me kind of a different perspective of, okay, now I see why that might not have worked the way that they anticipated. And I'm always happy when you're telling somebody else what they did wrong and not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've gotten, I've gotten to the point where if I got something bad to say, I always try to find something good to say because I don't want to be totally negative because the entire experience wasn't all negative. They're just small things that could be tweaked and be better than what they were. It's not that they were terrible. Sometimes they are. But for the most part, they could just be better than what they were. And honestly, that's what, as far as this, being human, that's what we should strive to do. Is just be better tomorrow than we were today. Very well said. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I always like to go around uh, before we close out. Dusty Dillinger, let's start with you. Is there anything you need to plug? Anything going on with you that you want people to know about or... Um, no. <laughs> no I'm, I'm, wow. I, I have, I'm, I have not been doing a whole lot of anything. Um, honestly, I've, I've gotten into storage auction, and I love it, and I'm kind of hooked on it. Um, it it's a great... Did you get a catchphrase yet? Thing. What's that? <laughs> you get a catchphrase yet? Yeehaw? No, no, no catchphrase or anything like that. But like, it's like, pay me! Yeehaw. Shit! <laughs> but, but my, my greatest find so far has been a it, it, it looks like the purple a reptile print ended up being a purple crocodile skin Prada handbag uh, praised out oh, to go to auction at $24,000 uh, got 17000 out of it because I sold it outside nice. the auction but I took a guaranteed payday over hoping you know and I got to the pay <laughs> window if you will Hey, we did, maybe. Ah, ah. But no, that's about it. I got nothing to plug, um, <laughs> unfortunately. But who knows? Never know what uh, tomorrow might bring. Absolutely, Michael McCormick. Is there anything in particular that you want the people to know? Anything you have to plug? Well, those are two different questions. I think. <laughs> well, you know, the family show. Things the family show. No, are are in books, I believe. Um, no, but I I am truly thankful to have uh, have had people around like Ripper and like uh, Dusty and uh, and I'm fortunate to have been able to kind of transition from doing sports and doing wrestling. Not really doing it now because Corona sucks. I mean, let's just be yeah. honest. But right. uh, I, I'm really proud of everything that we've done for Tales for the Indies. I mean, you can find it on iTunes when our uh, our host isn't being a dick and taking down <laughs> random episodes. Uh, I want to figure out how to maybe just kind of port them over to YouTube somehow so that uh, they're always there. But there are so many great people uh, and we've learned from and have had a lot of fun, but I'm really proud of that show. And when we get to do more of them, I'm always happy to have them out there. But I, I just, I feel so lucky at time, every show that we've ever done to be able to just sit down and try to put words to, and you know, like Dusty talked about, uh, singles match has five guys. Because of all five guys, the two commentators, the two guys in the ring, and the referee, if one of them isn't doing their job right, well, it's going to suck on yeah. some reason. And, and I've had guys tell me, you know, you didn't do us a service, and I've learned from that, and I hope that you go back and you look at YouTube and find all the matches, whether it be HWA, OCW, um, what do we do, CWAI, War wrestling, and you can listen to that and go, all right, this guy's not a complete idiot. He at least sounds like he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Ripper Blackheart, oh, yeah. is there anything you would like, any parting shots, anything you'd like to say before we close out? Oh, there, there's plenty of stuff you can see me on. Every Wednesday night on the FGW YouTube channel is a new episode. Now we're back up and running of FGW Shockwave. And uh, let's see what else we got. Whenever Tales from the Indies, whenever we do stuff, there's you've got that out there. Uh, I'm also the co host of the Everett Lee Show Uncut every Tuesday, now at seven o'clock 
and you can find that on the Everett Lee Show YouTube or uh, Facebook page. And let's say we got a War Wrestling Show coming up in November, uh, November seventh. November seventh, we got that coming up. Possibly an OCW show on the eleventh up in Akron. FGW every Friday night, Friday Night Fury in Hamilton, Ohio. So yeah, there's all that. Like I said, there's there's plenty of chances to uh, get your Ripper fix if you will. And uh, he's a greener at Walmart. Don't forget that. <laughs> I got fired from there. I got fired. Oh, there was that one incident. Thanks for bringing that up, Dick. There was an incident. <laughs> <laughs> there was a disagreement about whether we had to wear pants yeah. or not. Police reports oh, are filed. Satellite linked up. <laughs> well, Good gentlemen, guy. thank you, Dusty Dillinger, Michael McCormick, River Blackheart. Thank you for thank you for appearing on this and doing a special exploder. And we're going to close out tonight with a very special best of compilation of Ripper Blackheart. Enjoy, and until uh, next time, uh, my well, name's Dan. Best of if Ripper. Well, that's what we call it. Least Let's of. Just, well, that's between you and him. Maybe one, maybe one <laughs> clip on a continuous loop for 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Dan. This is Exploder. Have a good one. You don't know who I am? You don't know who I am? Let's Let's remember I was only on your show a couple weeks ago. That's Rupert Blackheart. I, I wasn't a part of that. I am. Sorry. <laughs> good reason. I, very, is this how you dress for an interview? Blackheart, I am without a doubt the greatest wrestling mind you ever step into this company. Get my foot in the door, and now I'm never ever going to leave. Got that world, the wrestling world? I am never ever going to leave. Wrestling is back for Fansgiving, Saturday night, November 7th, 
at the Empowered Sports Center, 1730 North Union Street, Lima, Ohio. Doors open at 530, bell time 7. Cody Jones will take on the war champion, the Voodoo King, Mojo McQueen, for the championship. That's fans giving Saturday night, November 7th, the Empowered Sports Center. For more information and tickets, go to warwrestling.com. All state mandates will be enforced at the event. 